So I welcome you all to the first ever inaugural uh, webinar being presented by the Maine Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry's School Integrated Pest Management Program. Uh, today, we're fortunate to have with us uh, Charlene Donahue, who is the preeminent entomologist in the state of Maine, who is very knowledgeable about uh, this brown tail moth. New problem has been building for a few years. Some of the schools in the state have already experienced this. Um, other schools probably will experience it in the near future. So we thought we should uh, provide some information for you to help you deal with this insect. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Charlene. Uh, this is Charlene Donahue with the uh, Maine Forest Service. And uh, um, we've had brown tail moth in the state for a long time, and uh, but it's definitely become a bigger problem more recently. So one of the first things to remember is that there are a lot of insects out there in the world and the great majority of them do no harm. And we need to make sure that we protect all those insects that are vital to every single ecosystem on Earth. Uh, in Maine, we have over 20,000 species and there's a lot of them out there that we want to make sure keep on doing their work so that we have a healthy uh, environment for, for us as well as them. But there are a few insects that do cause problems, and brown tail moth is certainly one of them. The problem with brown tail moth is twofold. It has toxic hairs that can cause a rash in people and respiratory distress in sensitive individuals. The caterpillars also feed on trees, uh, on the leaves of trees, and over time this can cause branch dieback. Uh, and tree mortality. Brown tail moth first came to North America through Somerville, Massachusetts back in the late 1800s and quite rapidly spread across New England and into the Maritime provinces so that by 1914 uh, it had reached its, uh, its as far as it has gone in the United States. And then it started to reduce back during the 20s. Uh, and um, part of this was due to the efforts of people. Um, there were webs that were clipped and burned by the tens of thousands. And that picture that you see there is actually students at a school out in their apple orchard cutting the brown tail moth webs out of trees. We probably don't recommend um, having the students do that today, but this is what they did 100 years ago. There were spray projects. Apple trees were cut down. There was a federal quarantine on brown tail moth up until the 1980s. And there was a huge biological control program looking at parasitoids and predators of brown tail moth and gypsy moth as well uh, in hopes of bringing the, the pests under control. In the 1920s, as I mentioned, the population collapsed and it's not really clear exactly what caused that. Probably a combination of the parasitoids, which are flies and wasps, the weather and a fungus uh, all came together to bring the population under control in most of North America, uh, except for uh, remnant populations in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and along the coast of Maine. This is a graph of the acres of trees that have been defoliated since 1994. And you can see it, brown tail kind of bubbled along in the 90s and peaked in 2003 at over 10,000 acres. And then it dropped back a little blip in 2010. And now in 2016, we're really seeing a lot of acres that have been affected by brown tail moth and affecting more people at the same time. Where's the risk of brown encountering brown tail moth? It's really centered on Sagadahawk County moving into Cumberland County on the south and into Kennebec in uh, Knox counties to the north and east. This is the map for the summer of 2016. I haven't drawn one yet for 2017. I'll do that after we do our 
winter web surveys in January and February. Uh, but the footprint is going to be similar, just expanded. Nobody likes to see these life cycle charts, but it's really important to understand when the caterpillar is causing problems and when you have to be most concerned about brown tail moth. And we'll start up in the, the left hand corner. In April through June, the larvae are feeding on the leaves of trees. And as they feed, they molt their skins and those skins drop off, dry out, and the hairs that are on them break off and float around in the air. So there's lots of caterpillars out. There's not just the one caterpillar, but it's also all the skins and they can molt up to six times that are out in the environment as well. In the end of June, the caterpillars are done feeding and they make cocoons. And these can, co cocoons can be on trees where they'll web leaves together, or they can move onto structures like buildings under uh, eaves, uh, under boats, uh, under picnic tables, and they'll form kind of filmy webs uh, in those different locations. Sometimes it's just one pupa inside. Sometimes there are dozens and dozens of pupae all inside these webby cocoons. At the end of July and early August, the moths emerge out of those cocoons and mate and lay their eggs on the leaves of host trees. Uh, now, not only do the larvae have lots of hairs on them and all their molted skins that break off, but the hairs are also caught up in all of those cocoons as well. And those are the most toxic hairs, the ones that were formed at the end of the caterpillar's uh, stage. And now they're all caught up in the cocoons. As the moths work their way out of their pupa in the cocoons, they can also pick up some of those hairs. And, and so they, they're a little bit toxic, but not very much. So the adults lay their eggs on the leaves of host trees. The ones that are preferred are oak and apple. Those are most often what the, the uh, adults lay their eggs on. And then those eggs hatch in August and the caterpillars feed on the leaves of the trees in August and into September. And then they make their overwintering webs by taking leaves and folding them together and wrapping them in silk. Uh, and you will find these webs on the tops of the trees, it, way out on the tips of the branches in general. This year in Sagaduck Hop County, there are so many caterpillars that those webs are uh, sometimes further back in the trees and also in bushes, rose bush, bushes in particular as well. So the problem with the brown tail moth, as we mentioned, are the hairs on the caterpillars, the caskins, cocoons, and in the air when they break off from the caterpillars. They're microscopic, about 150 microns in length. The hairs that you see on the caterpillars uh, are not the ones that cause the rash. They're little teeny weeny ones closer to the body. These hairs blow around in the air and they stay toxic for one to three years. You can find them on the grass, the leaves, the brush in the summer, fall, and spring. So even though the springtime is the worst time when the caterpillars are out and feeding, that's when you're most likely to come into contact with the hares. Anytime you're mowing, weed whacking, chipping brush, any of those kinds of activities, the whole summer, spring, fall, you can still come down with the rash. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to stop for a minute and let Barbara talk.
Uh, this is uh, Kathy Murray again. I just wanted to um, thank Barbara in advance. Barbara is the school nurse uh, with the Gardner Area High School, and she has had some personal experience uh, both in her home community, I believe, but also at Gardner School, which uh, Gardner High School, which experienced the brown tail moth problem last year. Um, so, okay, and I believe from what I'm seeing, I'm speaking. I am. And so my experience with brown tail moth does go back quite a few years because I lived actually in the Brunswick area and worked there um, and so have dealt with seeing it and experiencing it for a number of years now. For the school nurses listening, a great resource in our school health manual. Um, you see the uh, website. It is a great document. It, in fact, was created in 2008. So that lets you know how long that this issue has been known to school nurses. Um, if you can go to the next slide, um, brown tail moth is a contact dermatitis. It, you know, similar to poison ivy, it varies in how it affects an individual. There are some people who do not get a rash at all, and there are some people who are severely affected and will, in fact, need a referral at, to their physician, um, their primary health care provider, and will need a number of methods to help manage the rash. Um, it is most common in late June and July. Uh, but as Charlene said, this rash can occur at any time, especially when people are outside working in areas where these little hairs are found. The rash can develop right at the time of exposure, but it also can be delayed, just like a typical poison ivy rash. The duration can be from hours to days, and the treatment is focused on relieving symptoms. And so if you have any uh, school physician orders and you stock hydrocortisone cream, dermatologists will tell you that hydrocortisone cream twice a day, um, especially for mild rashes, um, is enough to help. If the rash is extensive, if it is really weepy, if the student is having difficulty sleeping, um, that's when you want to refer them to their primary care to be evaluated for further management. You definitely want to educate them about eliminating exposure and also some of the ways that they can manage the rash. A common one, given the time of year, we have kids out in the sun, they're exercising heavily and certainly in showers. And when they heat their bodies up in any way, that rash is going to look worse and can feel worse. Um, these kids complain of intense itching. And so letting them know while this rash is active to not spend a lot of time out in the sun. Um, and after they're exercising, when they do shower, make it a cooler shower rather than a warmer one. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, given that this moth um, has been around so much in the Midcoast area, there's a pharmacist, Jerry, who is mostly retired now, but he worked at a Midcoast hospital, and he created a spray that has been very helpful for people who get the rash easily and have difficulty managing it with just over-the-counter hydrocortisone cream. Um, Kennebec Pharmacy, uh, you can find them at Big Coast Hospital. The phone number is there. Patrice Cotter is the current pharmacist who mixes this up. It is, uh, you do need a prescription, and the reason for that is the steroid that is included, and it is a prescription strength. This spray includes the steroid, some alcohol, menthol, and Benadryl. Um, you get a 100 milliliter bottle, and that is typically enough to manage the rash of one exposure. Since there is no insurance billing, it is helpful to let families know that the cost is um, $43. And given the ingredients, uh, Patrice wants people to make sure they spray down and away and avoid the eyes. 
Students uh, who have a history of asthma can also develop respiratory symptoms. It can be difficult to know if, you know, certainly when you're presented with a student having an asthma episode, is this episode related to brown tail moth? Certainly if it is time of year, you have an issue in the area, um, you would want to consider that and maybe have them referred. Yeah, they can be put on steroids to help make sure that that doesn't exacerbate to, um, to any extreme. And so two, two springs ago, I had a student walk into the office here and had uh, the typical rash on the side of his neck. And I, as I was looking at it, I said, gee, how did you get this? Where did this happen? And he told me that he had a tickle on his neck, and he just reached up and went to touch it, and he mashed a caterpillar. And I said, wow, where'd, the ca where'd you find the caterpillar? Well, it happened to be right out in the back of the school. And so I went out there and saw these caterpillars climbing up the back of the school, and um, I on the trees and they look pretty familiar to me so i put a couple in a cup i was very lucky to have somebody in the building who had a connection to charlene and so sent these caterpillars home and yes indeed they were identified as the brown tail moth and so we were given um, charlene's contact number and i will let charlene and john finish that story <laughs> Well, first, uh, we're giving uh, people an opportunity to ask um, questions of Barbara. Uh, let me enable the microphone rights for everybody, So, um, but it should say one person at a time. All right. Uh, so I think if you have uh, any questions for Barbara right now, we'll have another opportunity at the end. Uh, you could either uh, raise your hand, um, turn on your microphone, or type into the chat box. We'll give people just a minute to unmute their microphones if they have any questions. And seeing none, uh, probably you're all thinking about it. We'll give uh, folks another opportunity at the end. Um, and with that, um, I'm going to turn it back over uh, to Charlene to talk a little bit more about um, how to detect it and what to look for. Back to the story from uh, Gardner High School in, in a few minutes, because it is a good story uh, if, for people to understand how these things can show, show up in, in your school. Uh, but right now, I'm going to talk about the kinds of things that you could do to see if you have brown tail moth at your school, or if you already know you do have them, where exactly they are, so you can make a plan on how you're going to address the problem. You can start looking now for the webs in the trees. If you have oak trees, it's a little difficult because the leaves are still on the trees and that's why we wait until uh, in winter time to do our surveys. The, the webs are primarily in oaks and apple trees, but they can be found on other fruit trees, roses and hawthorns. Those are kind of the second tier. Other hardwood trees and shrubs, birches and elms are another a couple of trees that you can find the webs in. They're up on the very tips of the branches and they're very tightly attached to the, the branches. They're about four to six inches long. There's bright white silk attaching leaves to the branch. Because what the caterpillars do is they're, uh, there's a whole group of them, it can be from a few dozen to hundreds and, and sometimes thousands of caterpillars making one web. And they take the leaves, wrap the silk around the leaves and tightly to the branch so that the webs don't fall off of the branches. And then they make little chambers inside 
with just a few caterpillars in each chamber. And that's one of the reasons why they can survive the winter so well, is that silk is a good insulator and they just have a little chamber with a few caterpillars in each one. And that's all they have to keep warm at any one time. So what you're looking for is bright white silk tightly bound to a branch. And that's often what you can see is where the silk is attached to the branch of the tree on a day like today here in Augusta when it, where it's sunny, that a white silk really gleams in the sunlight. Uh, it's tightly bound together because they need to spend the whole winter there. And there are little tiny caterpillars inside. One thing you could easily get those webs confused with are old fall webworm webs. And the fall webworms are found in ash trees, lilacs, apple trees again. Uh, there is a overlap on the primary hosts there. And they're, they're big filmy webs that the webworm made in the summertime. And now they're falling apart. They're loose, they're dirty, they come apart easily, and there's no little caterpillars inside. Uh, so that's the probably the, the biggest web that you could get mixed up with with the brown tails. Uh, so you go out and you do your survey and see if you have any webs there, if your schoolyard is infested, uh, and, and how much. Is it just a few in the crab apple trees around the school, like it is in Gardner? Uh, I know one of the, the elementary schools there has a few out front. Um, or is it festooning all the oak trees and the apple trees as it is in Topsail. So what can you do once you identify you do have brown tail moth? On low trees and shrubs, you can prune out the brown tail moth webs in the winter time while those little caterpillars are uh, just sleeping for the winter. Destroy them, you can soak them overnight in a bucket of soapy water. Let's go back here for a minute. Uh, you could run them through a chipper. Uh, you could burn them if if you have that capability. Probably a lot of the schools don't. Uh, but the, one of the important points here is don't just drop them on the ground because there is the possibility that the caterpillars in the springtime could climb back up onto the trees and reinfest the trees. So uh, you do want to do something with them. Uh, I know in Topsum, they talked about you could take them to the transfer station. They can either be composted there because they're a hot compost piles or they would be chipped. So prune out all the webs that you can, can find and uh, destroy them if they're in low trees and shrubs. Your options for large trees and, and bigger infestations are much more difficult and they're going to be costly. So one thing that you could do is cordon off infested areas in the springtime and that will reduce the problem somewhat. You'll still have airborne hares uh, and, and you know you do have to get away from those trees so it may be a pretty big area that needs to be cordoned off and it may not be practical. You could look at hiring an arborist to prune out the webs during the winter. It is non-chemical, but it can be very expensive, especially if you're talking about using a bucket truck and going up to the tops of the oak trees. And a lot of those webs still might not be uh, able to be pruned out because the trees are too tall or too far into the crown where the bucket can't go. Uh, this, is, this is not an easy problem to solve by any stretch of the imagination. You can also hire a licensed pesticide applicator to treat trees with a pesticide. Uh, and there is a list of licensed pesticide applicators on the main Forest Service Brown Hill website. And that's a very long uh, URL there. If you uh, type a brown tail moth name into your search engine, then this website will, the, the brown tail moth website will come up and this is one of the pages that is on there. It is costly and so this is something that will have to be found in the budget for schools that are heavily infested with brown tail and it does require planning ahead and this is a time that, of year that you need to start 
thinking about brown tail and planning what you're going to do. In fact, it may be too late because it's not in the budget. Uh, so this is a discussion that needs to be had with uh, uh, school administrators as well. In the future, August treatments may be possible. That's something that uh, we're looking into right now. Uh, and the reason that this would be advantageous is if you remember back to that uh, brown tail moth life cycle, the caterpillars hatch out in August and do some feeding at that time. They're very small, there's plenty of leaf surface out there to hold uh, a pesticide, and they're susceptible to the chemicals uh, more readily than the older caterpillars in the spring. The reason it hasn't been done in the past is it's hard to determine which trees have uh, brown tail moth caterpillars on them when they're just doing a little bit of feeding. So that's something that needs to get worked out, but it is uh, a, a possibility for the future. So for your plan of action, if you have brown tail, you do need to notify school authorities so you can come up with uh, what your plan of action is going to be. Decide if you're going to prune webs have a spring chemical treatment or a combination of the two, and then there'll be notification of staff, students, and parents of the infestation. And at this point, uh, oh, oh, and one more thing. Um, the Maine Forest Service and Maine CDC are working on posters and information sheets on the brown tail that we can uh, distribute to schools as needed and those should be ready in the next uh, next month or so. And Kathy? All right, well, thank you, Charlene. Um, while we're talking about it, I did want to uh, remind you that, uh, especially you integrated pest management coordinators for your schools, that there are some record keeping requirements and it's, it's always helpful to keep track of those records anyway, um, so that you and your successors will know what you did, what worked, and uh, um, and what didn't work. So don't forget to keep the, your pest records in your pest activity logbook. Uh, you'll want to keep records of the pest monitoring records, what you saw, where you saw it, uh, the date, the location, and any non-pesticidal application, you know, uh, activities that you did, for instance, clipping out uh, the webs or wetting down an area before mowing. If you are going to do pesticide applications, of course, remember you have to have a commercial applicator license in order to do that. Um, you IPM coordinators must approve that application in advance. You need to, uh, because if you're going to be doing it in May and the August uh, treatments are not yet uh, recommended, but in May school is still in session, so you'll need to send a notice home to parents and staff at least five days in advance and post a sign at the primary access point to the treatment area as well as the main office of the schools that use that area at least two days in advance. Um, those tools, the templates, you can find the uh, a, a sample data sheet um, that you can use for the pest monitoring information is available on our website, and I'll show you that in just a moment. Uh, but this is the example of the monitoring log where you, you write uh, the date that you saw something, uh, what it was you saw, the specific location that it occurred, um, and then what IPM steps were uh, taken, for instance, if you're going to clip out the webs or something like that. Uh, this is that form that you'll use to uh, determine for yourself, uh, walk yourself through the process about whether you need to notify parents and staff five days in advance and whether you need to post the signs and also that you can use to sign off saying that you have approved that pesticide application, which will have to be done more than five days in advance if you're going to notify parents and staff. The information that you'll need on this is the site where you're going to be making the application. Um, the uh, product name and EPA registration number, and you'll need to get that off the label of the product that's going to be applied, the pesticide product. So you'll want to get a copy of the label from your um, applicator in advance so that you can write down the name of the product, the EPA registration number for that. Um, here is uh, that 
a guideline that uh, tells you whether you need to notify parents and staff, whether you need to authorize it, and whether you need to post signs two days in advance. And for this kind of application, it is this last category of an outdoor application uh, made while school is in session. So yes, you do need to authorize it in advance. Yes, you do need to notify parents and staff five days in advance. And yes, you do need to put up the signs. And that line at the bottom is where you sign off to say that yes, you approve uh, that. Um, our website, the main.gov slash school IPM, there's a beautiful picture of Coney High School on the front. You'll recognize that when you get there. Over on the right hand side under tools, templates, and tips, that's where you can click um, and then scroll down on that page to find those uh, three, well, two um, sheets that you can use to record uh, what you saw and what actions were taken. Um, so with that, I will open it up to um, other people. Uh, participants, your microphones are now open. So as I say, there's a you can click to raise your hand up on the upper right. Ah, Chris Shaw says, please forward information on how to get posters once they are available. I will. Good uh, suggestion, Chris. I'll uh, send a link out to all the new information, including those posters, uh, to everybody on the uh, school IPM listserv. Any other questions? Uh, Chris? For the pesticides to be applied. Um, and the reason for this is that the, the this two it's twofold. One, the caterpillars are just starting to come out of their webs and probably not all of them are out. And the other reason is there's no leaves out at that point. The caterpillars come out before the leaves come out on the trees and there's nothing for the pesticide to land on so that the caterpillars can eat it. This is usually two modes of action uh, with pesticides. One is contact, that you know they might get hit directly when the spray is applied. Uh, the other is, in, or they have to walk across it so that there needs to be some leaves there. If there's just a little bit on the branch, it may not be enough to contact, to kill them. And then if there aren't any leaves out, then they're not gonna eat it. So you really have to wait until May and uh, the development of the trees is far enough along. If town sprays can, if the town sprays, can their notifications cover school IPM requirements? No, if the town is the applicator and sprays properties that are used by the school for regular school activities, then it is the responsibility of you, Chris, and other integrated pest management coordinators at your schools to send those uh, notifications home to the, the families and the staff uh, of, those, um, of that school. The area is going to be treated. Any other questions? Well, those are good ones. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, Charlene uh, talk a little bit more about some of the precautions and then we'll open it up for general questions. Oh, no, then we'll have, oh, we were going to have, sorry, you know what, we were going to have John uh, Stonier um, share a little bit of his uh, experiences now. Uh, John, are you there? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Uh, excellent. And thank you, Kathy, for inviting us today. I really appreciate it and for all of your help. For our experience, we were very fortunate to have Charlene close by uh, to come down and help identify our, our problem. For us, it was unbelievable that we had thousands of these caterpillars crawling from the trees all over the side of our school and gymnasium. We were fortunate that there were not a lot of trees in this area, so we believe they were trying to get somewhere else, and which meant they had to go through our gym and around it to get to, to more trees. 
Uh, at the time, the pest company that we were using, the contracted company, was not able to spray for them. So we were able to find a licensed company that was approved from the state to come in uh, and help us spray for those, which we did the full notification to all of the families. Uh, we were also very fortunate to have a nurse, Barbara uh, Chisholm, who helped us and helped to take care of the students because of the area that this was in. We had tons of students that unfortunately had been in this area. So we immediately uh, coned off and marked off this area to try to keep the students away from it. Um, I think our biggest advantage was that we didn't have a lot of trees in the area. So once we got through this battle, we then went out at the appropriate time and removed any nests that we found. And we continue to do that each year and basically have reduced it down to almost a 0% as far as far as a population problem for us, uh, we just basically basically use the soap and water method to soak them, and then just disposed of them afterwards, and that worked very well for us. So I've never had to spray again, but I'm very confident if I had to spray, I have the right company and and would be able to do so properly if needed. And that's pretty much what we went through and. Again, I, I want to caution anybody, if you do experience this, to make sure you talk with your staff about not mowing in those areas. Do not think that you can take a handheld leaf blower and blow these pests away. Uh, the minute you start to get any of these hairs up into the air, it can be very, very bad. And I personally made it so that I was the only one that would mow in those areas and we used a bagging system to collect the grass. And even though I was covered head to toe and tried to be very safe and I did it when it was damp in the mornings, I still got some rashes uh, from the caterpillars and I had never experienced anything like that. That's not like me to get a rash from things like that. So it is really, really bad. Um, and that's pretty much what we dealt with here in Gardner. Thanks, John. Um, John, there's a question that's come up for you already, so I think we should take advantage of that. It says, uh, what town are you in and what year did you spray? We're in the town of Gardner, and it was the uh, it was right in the spring of 2014 that we experienced this. So you sprayed in the uh, May of 2014, and then in the fall, you clipped the uh, nests out of the trees? Yes, that's correct. We went through, and once every, all the leaves were gone and we could see all the nests clearly, we were able to clip those out and remove them. Uh, luckily, the trees were not too, too high, so we, and we had some long pruners that we were able to get to them with. So this is Charlene. Uh, John's brought up a, a couple of points. Uh, one was that the caterpillars ate all the leaves off the trees that they were initially on and then started crawling across the grass and pavement and up the buildings and onto the benches where the students sat when they were waiting for, you know, outside of the gym. Uh, so there were caterpillars in a lot of a lot of places that were not on trees. One of the things that you can do in those locations is uh, use a, a hose to spray the caterpillars down and get them off of the buildings. You can use a HEPA vacuum to vacuum them up and get rid of them. And those are mechanical uh, activities that can be done and don't require a license. Okay, But whatever you do, you want to make sure you do it when things are wet. Because as John said, if you try to blow them with a, a leaf blower or a mow when it's dry, all those hairs get stirred up in the air and affect not only the operator of that equipment, but anybody else in the area as well. Um, there's something else I was going to say along those lines, and now I've forgotten it. Uh, oh, I know what the other thing was. Uh, so Gardner is not in the the most heavily infested area of the state and it was it's fairly localized in Gardner there's just some spot infestations like I said earlier one of the other school has a few webs at it that it will need to get pruned out this year and that the pruning is very effective on those 
locations that are are not heavily infested. You really can knock it down and just by keeping an eye on those trees, keep it under control with pruning. The way it may have come into the Gardner High School is uh, during the summer when the moths are flying, if someone is down on the coast and the end of July, beginning of August, and then they drive up to Gardner High School and they're playing tennis or they're watching a practice or uh, something like that, then they can bring those moths with them to a new location. And we've seen that in, in a number of instances. So uh, the moths can fly very well and they can get blown by the wind and move around the state or people can move them. Uh, and this year we have seen uh, brown tail moths caught in traps from Elliott down on the New Hampshire border up to Millinocket to Topsfield in Washington County uh, and Rope Bluffs along the coast. So it's in, and there's infestations in Turner, Waterville, Winslow, Palermo, Augusta. So it is inland as well. Lewiston Auburn is another area that's infested. Uh, so it's it's pretty getting more broadly spread. And let's see, Chris says, have any towns declared an emergency nuisance? And do you expect any towns to? No towns have declared brown tail moth a nuisance to date. And there is a, a state law allowing towns to do this. Uh, Bowdenham is talking about doing it. And I don't know if any if the other towns are thinking of it or not. This gives the, the towns more flexibility in what they can do and how they can help residents out. Okay, well, I think um, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, those are good questions and I um, thank you. Uh, John and uh, Barbara both for sharing your experience. Uh, let's move forward to um, Charlene talking about the uh, brown tail moth precautions. Uh, so if you're, this is for, uh, you know, staff, if you're out there and you need to do groundwork, should wear coveralls that are co closely tight, uh, close tight at the, the neck, wrists and ankles goggles, a respirator, and if you get into respirators, then there's issues with uh, fit tests and training and the cost of the respirators. So, you know, this, this becomes expensive. Uh, uh, but these are things that can really help reduce the impact on people who are in the area. And this is when you're doing things like mowing, raking, weed whacking, removing those uh, those pupil webs uh, later in the season. The other thing that can help is performing these activities on uh, days when, when it has rained early in the morning, like John did, uh, wetting down the area with a hose, anything that will get those hairs wet so that they don't fly around in the air. And that's the end of my presentation. Uh, if there's more questions, be happy to answer them. The microphones are open. Uh, now is your chance to ask any of the presenters any further questions you have. My contact information is on this sheet here. I am willing to answer questions uh, if you give me a call or send me an email. Uh, and I can see what I can do to help you out. We're also going to be working with uh, Cooperative Extension in getting their agents uh, trained about brown tail moths so that they'll be able to be a resource as well. Well, thank you so much, Charlene and Barbara and John, for uh, this really helpful information. Uh, we'll leave the lines open for just a minute more to see if anybody has any questions. Um, I will be posting the recording of this webinar on the school IPM website. Uh, click under 
pest solutions on the right hand side. There is a link for brown tail moth there. We'll put the uh, link to the posters and to uh, this webinar there. I see there is a question coming, so we'll give it just a minute more here. Feel free to speak your questions too, because your microphone, if you uh, click on the green icon at the top of your screen, you can just speak into the microphone. If there are no further questions, I will again say thank you so much to all three of our uh, presenters and um, encourage you to contact Charlene if, you have, uh, if, yeah, if you've got technical questions that she might be able to help with. She's a tremendous resource. So again, thank you everybody and thanks to the participants for joining today.